come from Earth, a planet of outlaws. My name is Peter Quill. There's one other name you might know me by. Star-Lord. Who? Well, Star-Lord, man. Legendary outlaw. Guys? Forget it. So here we are. A thief, two thugs, an assassin, and a maniac. But we're not gonna stand by as evil wipes out the galaxy. I guess we're stuck together. Partners. Are you telling me the fate of 12 billion people is in the hands of these criminals? Oh, yeah. I look around, you know what I see? Losers. But life's giving us a chance. To do what? Something good? Something bad? A bit of both. Oh, what the hell? I don't got that long a lifespan anyway. like me, except me. They call themselves the Guardians of the Galaxy. This might not be the best idea. What's up? We're Boy, back. Howdy. Hello. It's we are back. The script. Beat Sheet Edition. Resurrected. Been uh, too long, man. Been too long, but we're back. Um, Chris Durham, Keith Miller, David Negrin, my script doctors I got with me for Guardians of the Galaxy. The Galaxy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> galaxy, Galaxy, Galaxy. Galaxy, Galaxy, Galaxy. Guardians, <laughs> Guardians, Guardians. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. Definitely. Guardians. This is a... Very exciting to do a big tent pole. Um, this Guardians of the Galaxy. There was a lot of, of speculation about whether Marvel was taking a chance doing a, a, a slightly lighter comedic uh, tent pole uh, 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 comic book film, um, but apparently On a property it, no one knows really. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. No, very like no no uh recognition of of them at all. Yeah. And you know, and they've had they've had uh you know, not so good luck in the past with uh with properties that that weren't well known, right? Like like The Punisher was never big because it's kind of a fringe comic and yeah. uh you know, even Daredevil, you Daredevil. know. Daredevil. Yeah, yeah. Right? But but Guardians of the Galaxy proved that you can you can you can introduce a mass audience to a new set of heroes, and if you do it well, high quality story, great scripts. As I'm sure we're all going to agree. I don't know. Maybe you'll disagree with me tonight. Um, you know, people are down for it. Uh, even yeah. even Chris Pratt yeah. isn't even the star, right? Right. Right. But I mean, the thing is, you know, you mentioned The Punisher <clears throat> and Daredevil. Now. Basically, the, those are two characters coming out of the Marvel Universe that should have been completely easy to do. They're on opposite um, sides of the spectrum, right, in terms of, like, the vigilante stories. And it's, yeah. in terms of, like, budget-wise, it's very simple to do. But for whatever reason, Marvel never seen to get his act together. It's this creative team to put together, like, a good story in the well, way that you were able to... Well, you know, here. they're very, they're, they've always been afraid to go comedic with these uh, comic book movies because that's, I think, that how they feel 
they are the the audience will think they'll think they're campy, you know. They'll think that there is, um, you know, that it's it's for kids. It's not for adults, and then they won't get that wide audience. Um, you had a little bit of camp, campy comedy in the early uh, uh, Spider-Man movies, but for the most part, they keep them serious because. They're afraid uh, adults won't go see these. But but the the early Spider-Man movies, those were you know th- those were Sam Raimi's kind of signature, right? That 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 camp yeah. is, is just yeah. is just right in his wheelhouse. But you know I think over time what's happened is, you know you you've got some master storytellers at Marvel, you know, and and like all these other kind of fringe properties were going on before. You know, Marvel was Marvel in terms of the movies they're making, right? It was be- it was before Iron Man, it was before Avengers, it was before Thor. You know, and now they got their mojo, and you know they're also finding that along with like serious storytelling that's going on in these, you know, like there there are there's some levity going on, right? Like there there's a lot of fun being had in like the Avengers. You know, you, right. you, you you've got yeah. you, know, you know you've got a movie where like you know. Early on in the Avengers, you you've got you know this old Holocaust survivor standing up to Loki, and then at the end you got Thor going puny god and tossing him around, right? Like you, yeah. you they're, they're finding that balance. Well, so okay, let's, so, not, forget, so, let's not forget the Schwarmies. <laughs> exactly. So you mentioned the the master storytellers that Marvel has. Um, you've got Joss Whedon, of course. Uh, they took a chance on Joss Whedon. Which you know, everyone in the fanboy world and everyone who's ever seen Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Firefly, uh, that's a setup that's going to pay off later. Everybody uh, knows that you know you you know Joss Whedon was a master storyteller way before he got into features, right? Um, but um, they took a chance on him. Hollywood took a chance on him, and he hit it out of the park, right? Because he was this writer, director, auteur. He was a fanboy. He did. Res- he did uh, justice to the fanboys and and to the mythology of Avengers, and he did um, uh, he he made a movie that was uh, uh, accessible to a wide audience, and you know surprise he wrote a story where all five of the characters had a, a, a role. They weren't just standing there. Every one of them had a story. There was multiple character arcs. Um, I mean, this is good writing. This is great writing, and I'll say that. Our uh, our master storyteller tonight for Guardians of the Galaxy, right? James Gunn has done the same thing. Uh, not to the degree of the Avengers. I will say this movie was successful. It was fun. It's probably the best movie this summer. But and uh, it's starting to approach Avengers. But James Gunn took a, a lot of um, the the story pages out of uh, uh, out of Joss Whedon's uh, uh, playbook and succeeded at them. I wouldn't be surprised. If Joss Whedon was in on some of this uh, uh, secretly, oh, I'm sure. I mean, oh, you know, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Marvel, like, like the whole Marvel Studios thing, like they, you know, it, it, it's never just one guy, right? Like they, they've got, they've got a 50 year plan for these movies, <laughs> and, and, and everybody's involved, right? Joss is involved because because he's worked as Mojo, and you know, everybody knows, like. You know he's had a couple. You know he, he's he's maybe had a couple misses, but but nobody can doubt his uh, his ability to handle the mythic, right? Like that. And when you're talking about when you, when you're talking about uh, Buffy, that's mythic. You know when you talk about like uh, Doctor Horrible, right? Dr. He created Horrible. a mytholo- absolutely. Yeah. He created he created a mythology with it within a 40 minute web series, right? Yeah. Like he created his own mythology. Like he can handle the mythic, and and and, and that's where that mojo is. You know, and then you know you get these kind of you know these great directors, and you know they go in different directions with these guys, and, and they each are able to put their own character into it, and, and they're Whereas just fucking awesome. As in comparison, you know, I watched Man of Steel again this week. You know, yeah. Zack Snyder has never had uh, 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 a a an expertise in story. Okay, he's a uh, director's director. He's not a writer's director. You know, he focuses on the all the set pieces. Um, yeah, visual. Every every time Zack Snyder has uh, attached to a story uh, to a property that didn't already have the story in place, um, he, in my opinion, ha- has tripped. Okay, if you talk about um, if you talk about uh, um, the Watchmen, okay, that was n- that was not in play. That story was not in place like 300. 300, the graphic novel became the movie. There was no problem there, right? So. But with 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 um, 
with the Watchmen, there was an adaptation that was involved. It was a very hard adaptation because um, there was so much material. And in the end, I, I think, you know, Watchmen was a good movie, but it failed on a story level because he couldn't wrangle all the story elements. Um, and then um, y you want to talk about a total failure, right? Uh, Zack Snyder's, uh, what was the other comic book one he did? Um, oh, Sucker Punch? Sucker Punch, right. So Sucker Punch was a total story failure. It was. Well, I was under, under the impression that Sucker Punch is really sort of like his own creation. I don't know if it was based on a comic book. No, it was based, it was based on a graphic novel. novel. Based on a comic? Yep, graphic novel. Oh. And, and, um, and, and, and the story had to be uh, culled from a, from a mythology that was already there, and he failed at it. What Joss Whedon was successful at and what, uh, uh, what Gunn was successful at, James Gunn, uh, tonight. So let's, let's focus on Guardians now. You know, let's talk yeah. about James Gunn. You know, his successes in the past were the Dawn of the Dead remake, which I loved. I thought that was fantastic. Um, yep. And he's known, um, you know, for a very successful cult movie called Slither. What do you guys yep. think of that? Oh man, you, you know what? Yeah, uh, yeah. He he's got like a a, a long pedigree. You know, like yeah. not not only that in terms of cult like movies, a, like a cult pedigree, right? Yeah, well, a cult pedigree. Well, well, to, to even take that further, I was checking out his IMDb, and one thing I didn't realize: if you go to the bottom of that IMDb page, his first screenwriting credit is Tromeo and Juliet. <laughs> he, was make, he was making. He was writing for Lloyd Kaufman back in the day, and now wow. he's right. Now he's writing for Marvel. That's yeah. crazy. That is inspiration right there. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? You know, a lot of the 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 uh, lot a lot of the best directors come out of the trauma tradition, right? So right. Um, yeah, Trauma or Corman or any of those guys. Yeah, right? yeah. Oh, Cor yeah. How many? How many? How many incredible directors owe their owe their his their their entire careers to? To Corman, right? So, right. Um, so let's talk uh, just general impressions. First off, before we get into the beat sheet, um, what did you think, Keith? What did you think of Guardians? <clears throat> well, I mean, I thought it was an absolute lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, basically, when I was like looking at the beat sheet and trying to break down the story, like I just to sort of put it all to the side and just realized it's kind of this. What I'm starting to see in terms of uh, Marvel's theme or shtick is you have a group of characters that you either relate to or you find affable. And it's not really so much important what's going on in the story, but as long as you're comfortable with these characters and you want them around, you're going to go for a good ride. And basically that's what we got with Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, it, it, was, yeah. it, was, your, it was like the perfect... Origin story with with all of the you know story conventions that you need, you know with with the um, the idea of it being um, an analogy for the creation of a family, and you know it's like <clears throat> this generation now is a family what you create not in which you were born in, and so you know with all of that in mind, I really enjoyed it, and you know they had a talking raccoon that was just destroying stuff, so yeah. <laughs> talking raccoon blowing shit up, exactly. <laughs> Chris, uh, just first, you know, general impressions, uh, Guardians. Yeah, well, you know, first, I guess, it, like, I'm impressed by the ambition and 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 just the balls of this movie. Like, it's it, it it's magical to me. Like, this is, you know, I, I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's definitely like in, in my top three, like Marvel flicks, superhero flicks. You know, um, and I think you know one thing that they did that that's a departure from what they did with with avengers you know avengers they had to like put all these pieces in place right they put thor they put cap you know they put all these characters in place before they brought them together uh you know with with uh guardians you've got you know, an ensemble piece that starts off as an ensemble piece. You introduce these characters, and, and you, you don't have to waste time uh, introducing these characters. And, and the, the the thing that was most uh, brilliant to me about it, and the thing I loved about it the most, was that, you know, in a normal superhero movie or a comic book movie, you have this, like, storytelling overhead of explaining or accounting for or adjusting for uh, you know the the idea that these superheroic characters exist in an ordinary world, right? You got this guy who's set apart, and then you got everybody else. And the thing I love about Guardians is that 
you know, you just start off in this world, right? Like, you, you know, you're you're in you're in this space, you know, world. You're in the galaxy, and you know, you've got some people who have you know some kind of superpowers, right? Like, cause you've got crazy guys like Thanos, and and you've you you got Ronin, and you got Infinity Stones, uh, you know. But you've also got people who are just badasses, you know, such as Gamora, uh, and, and yeah. you know, you you just go with it, you know, and, and from the beginning, you know, you're along for this interesting ride without without like they they spend a little bit of time on on you know on Star Lord's origin story, but it, it it's like very economical, right? Like this this is an origin story of a team, not an origin story of a bunch of individuals, and I I just love that. Yeah. You know, so, and from so, from there out, it's just a blast. I love this movie. Yeah. Okay. So so to me, you know, um, you know, I I'm I I didn't know anything about Guardians. I haven't read the comic books. Um, all I'd heard was. You know, Marvel's taking a chance on sort of an action comedy tentpole, and that's what this is. To me, this was not the superhero genre that we're used to. This was an action comedy on steroids. This was like a sci-fi action comedy, you know, Absolutely. like yeah. Zombieland or something, but with a huge budget, you know. And um, I couldn't help, I'm a huge fan of Joss Whedon's Firefly. And I could not help um, but notice the uh, the way that they structured this film um, and the the ship and the crew and the 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 uh, basically the uh, the island of misfit toys these uh, you know this 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 posse of misfits uh, who come together to save the universe and that is exactly, you know, the same format as Firefly was. And Firefly was also very comedic. That was Joss Whedon's uh, sci-fi western that uh, uh, only had, uh, it was a limited run, like 19 episodes. Oh, but everyone like, has seen. Yeah, right? Something like that. 13. Yeah, yeah. 13 episodes, okay? And um, and if, if, if you look even deeper back into the Joss Whedon um, catalog, you'll see a movie called Alien Resurrection. Has anyone caught that? <laughs> Has anyone seen Alien 4? <laughs> yeah, Sounds a little bit familiar. If you yeah. have, you'll notice that it was written by a young, up-and-coming Joss Whedon, okay? And it features a crew of misfits led by Ron Perlman and uh, with a Winona Ryder, and there is, uh, there is, uh, the Ron Perlman plays very similar to the, uh, to the Nathan Fillion character in Firefly, and very similar role to Chris Pratt in Guardians of the Galaxy. So it's this, I, I'm starting to see this misfit family sort of format, um, way back in 97 with Resurrection, then with Firefly, and then, uh, Joss Whedon's, I mean, it's his specialty, so I can't, I can't believe that he didn't have a role uh, in, in putting this together with James Gunn. Um, well, you know what, even, well, I mean, you know, let's give, you know, James Gunn the benefit of the doubt, right? Or just give him credit for the movie in which he wrote and, and, <clears throat> and directed Yes. You know, Josh Whedon has he created... Wrote it. I'm just saying it's the archetype, you know? It's, no, no, it's right, no, absolutely. Josh Whedon created this wonderful template, right? I mean, you know, you mentioned Alien Resurrection. You've got Firefly. I mean, I personally view, like, Titan AE. If you're not familiar with it, that's the, like, um, Seen it. animated movie. Good I think stuff. It's, I, 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 think that was, I think that was written by John August, actually. It was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, I was not. We didn't have anything to do with it. No, no, no. I don't know if he had anything to do with it, but the but the the writer was was definitely John August. Yeah. Okay. Well, in any event, right? You have the template, you know, in terms of um, you know, this loose band of misfits that come together to sort of create a family. You know, you've got Buffy, followed by Angel, followed by um, what was the what was the latest? <laughs> Josh Wheaton series. It only lasted two seasons. Josh Wheaton is, is on so Titan AE. Is he? Yes, he's, he's yeah. credited after John August. Oh, wow. Right. You nailed it. You nailed it. So, nice. so, I mean, that, even okay. Titan AE. The Wheaton stamp. The Wheaton stamp. 
you, Bam! Good, if you, good if call. You, if you look at it, right? He created this template, and you, you know, I, I always view Tiny E as sort of like the precursor to Firefly. Wow. Yeah. But if you if you look at it structurally, so I mean, you know, James Gunn had everything in which you you know to work with. It's there. Use it. Amazing, amazing, and you know what? This is just more. This is more, um, uh, more of a credit to Marvel and uh, Fige or whatever you say the guy's name is. Uh, Feige. Feige. Uh, the guys Feige. are in char- charge of um, uh, of Super Story over there, like putting their their trust in you know Whedonism, you know Whedonism. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I th- I think this, you know, like. The the whole thing with with casts of characters with with ensembles you know forming a family especially a bunch of misfits that come together for a goal, you know I mean like yeah Joss has definitely done a lot for that but you know it's 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 nothing new I th- I think it's just stressed and I think it's actually probably something that that you know a statement could be made about the longing for family you know in yeah. the, in, the mo- in the modern day and and, and seeing yeah. that and, play out on the screen right right right, right. Uh, touchstone. Right, uh, you know, everybody has, uh, uh, you know, like, it's a, just sort of, you know, America's like um, obsession with antiheroes uh, is very similar to America's obsession with, you know, the surrogate family, you know. Yep. So I think it's, I yep. think it's very real. Um, let's talk, um, let's talk beat sheet, guys. Yeah. So. Fritz, you want to, you want to, you want to start. Um, um, I could have done better homework on this. I was actually really enjoying the movie, and uh, I didn't mark my beats <laughs> down. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna list them off. Yes, opening image. Thanks, Keith. Yep. That's- I, I'm, I'm honestly in the same boat. You know, I, I, I did all my notes today because I was just kind of enjoying it too much, okay. and about halfway through the movie, I, I, I reminded myself that I should be looking. for Who's got things. an opening image? That's. that's- I, I got one though. So, so the. I- other- Okay, go ahead, Keith. No, I know. Go, go on. All right, all right. So, so my opening image is, is the young Peter Quill, a, who will become Star Lord, sitting in the hospital, listening to a mixtape while his mother is on her deathbed. Right, like. Right. So, so th- th- this is a very strong image, right? Like this is a kid who, who from the outset, is a loner. He's alone in the world, and he's losing his family. Right, and that's that. That's key to this whole thing, as we've already been talking about. He's losing his family. Yes. That is the the opening image. That's key. Got it. Right, and 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 you, I, the only thing I would add, Chris, is the fact that you know that opening image is he's separated from them. They're in the room, and he's looking. In fact, he's not even looking in because he knows something, you know, bad is happening. Something ominous is going on. But he's just there, and he's separated from whatever is happening. And like you said, that image of this his child, sort of like isolated in his music. Just sitting there alone. Yep. No. Absolutely. And that. And that, guys. And if if we can jump to the final image, how does that match up with the final image? Well, it's the exact opposite, right? Yeah. Because yep. you you have you have, you know, Peter Cole in the beginning was alone. He's losing his family. He's isolated. In the end, he's Star Lord. He's at the helm and of the ship. And he's got a family now. He's got a new. He's family. got a family. He's got a but but there there's even even more than just like a visual even more than just the image you know cue there he he he's opened the present that his mom has given him yeah right, finally, finally and it's it. it's a second mixtape yeah. so, it's it's, next. so that ties back to that initial event so not only is it tied visually you know and like with what's going on you know and yeah. you know like he's got a fa- he doesn't have a family then he has a family there there, there there's almost like you know, it, it's almost like his mother is reaching her hand down and saying, you know, giving her blessing on it, right, with, with this mixtape. Like, you know, you've completed this, you now have a family. Uh, you know, th- there, there's just that connection to that to that opening spot. Yeah, and, and you I'll, know, it, it, it speaks to the fact that, you know, he's never opened it until after this adventure and after he's found this surrogate family and all this time... Until he, you know, he, you know, uh, he never Quill never felt like he had the chan- the a reason to open it, but now he's starting to feel like he's got family around. He's got the courage to open it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody got a, a theme stated? That's always a tough one when you're looking back. Yeah, looking uh-huh. back. Keith, what you got? 
All right, here's the thing. I mean, for me, it was a little difficult. Um, and then, like, you know, it's just sort of like scrabbling my notes here. But, but the thing that kind of struck me is, like, the idea, like, his mother was there, she was dying, and she reaches out her hand. And it's like, take my hand, take my hand, son. And, and he can't do it, right? Uh-huh. And, uh-huh. and you, you, you know, one of the things that I saw stated is, like, you, you kind of have to, <coughs> you have to reach out. You have to be open. And, and Peter Quill, you know, young Peter at this point is not. And then later on in the film, he's kind of, you know, he's, that same situation happens. He has to reach out. Like his, you know, someone's reaching out for him. Gamora's reaching out for him. And, and you know, I mean, we know how that ends. He, he, he takes her hand. For me, one, yeah. of the things that, one of the things I saw stated is it's like this idea of, of sort of being internal, being inward, and, 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 and having to sort of have the courage to reach out, reach out for help. All of those characters, with the exception of Groot, had that problem. You know, from what I've noticed in the film, is that right. there are all these characters who are essentially alone and suffering in their own way. But the thing is, they dealt with it the way that they did. Sort of like, you, you know, you, Rocket was uh, a brigand, right? You know, yeah. he swore and he killed things. You know, Star-Lord, you know, <coughs> you know he hid behind his sort of like uh, Star-Lord persona, like, you know, I bed women, which, you know, that one line in the film was like, well, thankfully they don't have, what was it, like um, an ivy lighting or look like a Jackson Pollock? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. It's hilarious. They okay. don't have a black light in here. That was like yeah. one of the closest to an R-rated joke for the whole movies. <laughs> you know? Um, People brought kids to this movie. <laughs> right over their head. No, hopefully, hopefully that went over yeah, the kids, right? Yeah. Drax, well, you know, Drax lost his family. Ronan killed him right before his eyes. Yeah. So all of these characters are sort of like inward. Yeah, and, yeah. So, and, I, so I think, yeah, the arc, all these characters experience a similar arc, right, where they, where they decide to trust and they decide to become part of a family again, except Groot. Groot is like the one, you know, uh, solid... Solid character all the way throughout who knows right. who he is. And but he, actually, but he, he can't express anything except for I am Groot, right? That was, uh, just so I don't uh, forget it, one of my favorite reveals um, was, it, you know, story-wise, was that uh, Rocket actually could understand Groot. Right? Yeah, it, it, it's like R2-D2 and C-3PO, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The whole time you think I am, I am Groot is literally all he's saying, but then his best bud actually can understand him and starts translating him and then all of a sudden you're like this Groot is this like much more complex character and then when he saves the day in the end it is wonderful ah, I just, yeah, it's an yeah. amazing character Loved you know and, 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 and to go back to the, the whole thing about like the you know the individual versus the family right and that again this plays into the theme stated right we're, we're, we're you know yeah you're you, Keith, you said you know Drax lost his family. Gamora has you know obvious uh, difficulties with her father and her sister, right? She's kind of and, and it, you know even at one point he's not really her father. Thanos right. is not really her father, again. and that's revealed. And, and even even Rocket, right? Rocket is genetically engineered. He, he doesn't even know what he is. He won't he won't admit that he's a raccoon, right? Like like he, he doesn't have family. He's, <laughs> he's, gen- got, he's not even an alien who has people. He's he's an experiment. Right. So yeah. So this, that's that's kind of reinforced, right? And, and that that none of these people have anybody else except for Rocket, who so has a tree. Let's jump ahead to the beat for the setup, okay? One of the great things about this movie and why it succeeds on a story level is because the setup doesn't just set up the plot of the movie; it sets up the origin of the characters and it gives mm-hmm. them all like story objectives to complete before the end of the movie, okay? And much like Avengers, Avengers, they each have separate story objectives that have to be achieved by the end of the film, and they do. Um, so uh, what's, what, what, what's contained in the setup? Chris, what, what's our setup? So, so you know, the, the thing about the setup here, and the, the great thing about it, is, like, this is a lot of exposition, and this is a good example of good exposition, right? Every, everybody, you know, downplays exposition <laughs> because it's usually, you know, like, if it's handled poorly, it's crap. 
but but in this case, this is all like exposition because it's all introducing and setting up these characters, like you just said, and setting up their goals and setting up their backstories. Yeah, the, and so the and exposition the, is well dramatized, you know, because exactly. you, you introduce yeah. each of these characters in a in their own set piece where we get to know them, and then we also get the information, right? So what and it reinforces the theme, like right? So so uh, you it introduces Yandu, right? This character that's played by a uh, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Right, Michael Rooker, who plays yeah, uh, Yandu, right? Like, so, um, so you know, he's set up as like a surrogate father, a, a horrible surrogate father, but still a kind of a surrogate father figure for Star Lord, right? Like, he's the one who picked him up on Earth, and they've been running around the galaxy, you know, uh, you know, kind of as partners in crime, right? But it's a rocky relationship, and right? Yeah, he's like a solid. really poor, you know, bad stepfather, but he kind of likes him, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool uncle or something like that. And you introduce Gamora, right? And Gamora, ha you know, has this sister that you can already sense there's some kind of tension, right? Right. And, she's and, like a red. She's like a green-skinned step stepchild, right? A redheaded stepchild. Yeah. And I, I just gotta say, uh, Karen Gillan, who plays Nebula, right? Like, even hot in like fractal blue makeup. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. That, her character was, you know, uh, didn't get enough screen time. I think there was a lot more there. Yeah, um, no, there there was, you know, and and you, you know, so so the, so those are the, the the main two things, right? Like they during the setup portion, they and really the star, and, and the Star Lord origin, right? The Star Lord origin, the the you know the the as is situation really has to do with with Star Lord and, and you know his kind of surrogate family and and Gamora and what turns out to be her surrogate family, um, you know and, and then that it transitions and then, right? the and then also the setup of the plot with the uh, MacGuffin the uh, the rabbit's foot the uh, Bellerophon the, uh, yeah. the Maltese Falcon uh, the uh, <laughs> Lost Ark uh, well, or, or or as I what is it called the, the the infinity stone as i as I, as i heard one podcaster say when when commenting on this the the glowy blue thing that every marvel movie seems to have <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right so and so there's the MacGuffin. everybody wants it and who who has it ronan Ronan has it. Play oh no 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 i'm sorry ronan oh, well, doesn't star lord has star lord has it ronan, ronan wants yeah. it Right. Ronan, by the way, played by Lee, Lee Pace, who is on fire these days. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great performance. Yeah. Ronan is a really great bad guy. Maybe we'll talk about him. Let's talk about him now. I mean, Ronan is both the, um, both the physical uh, uh, antagonist and the cerebral antagonist. He's, you know, he's uh, the Empire. He's... He's the he's the stormtrooper and the Darth Vader you know, rolled into one. But, but I mean, can we can we talk about how he's introduced? Yeah, he's bathing in the blood of his enemies. <laughs> what better way to introduce a zealot? Got yeah, I gotta love that. Well, what do we know? What do we know about Ronan? We don't get a lot of backstory on him. We just get him. We know he's a badass because he stands up to Thanos. <laughs> he stands up to Thanos, Thanos. who is basically, you know, as far as we know, is like, you know, like some kind of space, He's a tight, yeah, space a tight, god, right? Yeah, yeah they call him a tight a demigod. Right. And Ronan doesn't mind talking shit to him. Right. And disobeying yeah. him, eventually. Well, 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 to be fair, he started talking shit after he got the Infinity Stone. Right, okay, that's true. Right. He's a little deferential in the beginning. So what's Ronan's uh, mythology? So he he is a he is a political extremist, right? Like he is. So there's this whole he he's a Cree, right? Like there or, or no he. So there's this whole Cree scroll thing going on in right. Marvel, like from back in the day. And, and I guess he is a political extremist slash terrorist uh, kind of character who is on the fringe of, like outside a peace agreement. And the, the, there there's. There is a little bit of a of a political setup there, much less than like say Star Wars Episode One. Yeah. Just enough to let you know that this is a bad guy. Right. Um. And and he's pretty he's pretty heavy and um he's he he looks like a badass. He's got this like you know blue sort of pharaoh thing going, and he's got a staff, and uh, it gets even you know the staff is. <laughs> 
and he puts the blue stone in, and he has the staff of Ra from, uh, yeah. in, from Raiders of the Lost Ark. I don't know. And, he, and yeah, he's, got a little, he's got a little bit of Kool Aid really mouth going on. Hammer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So our setup gets our 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 characters introduced. Um, Gamora's a redheaded stepchild. Star Lord is a um, is a uh, he has no no parents. He's a he's a what do you call that? Uh, orphan. He's an orphan, and 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 um, uh, Rocket is a, also kind of an orphan, but a badass. You know. But he, but Rocket's Rocket's not really there in the setup yet, right? Like no, yeah. No. Ro- Rocket kind of gets transitioned during the catalyst, I think. Right. Like okay. They, they transition him in. So what is guys? Uh, Keith, do you have a catalyst for us? Um, <clears throat> for me, I think the the, the catalyst, the, the thing that kind of sets everything in motion, is when um, Peter Star Lord steals the Infinity Stone, and yeah. then and then <clears throat> and then takes on um, Roman's guy. Um, what was this? What was the character's name? Oh, I can't remember. Um, they they never say it. I don't think. Um. I had it up on Wikipedia a while ago. I, I can't remember what his name is, but it's yeah, not that important. Dude. What's <laughs> more important? What's What's more important is that Star Lord comes upon the the orb, whatever, right? As part the of Infinity a Stone. right, right, and. So is that our catalyst, Chris? Is that what you had? I I I, I kind of disagree with that. I, okay. I think the okay. catal- I think the catalyst, the thing without w- without which the rest of the movie does not exist. And the thing that really kind of brings them together and and causes you know the rest of this to happen, is Gamora's attempt to steal uh, the orb, uh, while uh, Star Lord is trying to to sell it. Right, like that. That's that's kind of the thing that brings them all together at that point. Um, you know, because as far as Star Lord is concerned, as far as Quill is concerned. You know, he's just got this thing. He had a challenge getting it, and now now he's there to sell it and go on with his life, right? But but then he meets Gamora, who's after it, and at the same time he meets Rocket, who who is a bounty hunter and finds him and and, and wants to bag him, right? Well, so let, let's make this more simpler. What is the A story of this movie? Okay, what is the mission that these guys start off on? What is uh, Star Lord's mission? Sell the Infinity Stone. Just get it, get it to uh, or the orb at this point. Yeah, it's an yeah, orb. Yeah, get the orb to the fence. Gamora has some contact, right? Who can sell it, right? Uh, yeah, that's re- that's revealed a little later on. Like, um, he's get- Quill has the contact that he's going to sell it to, right? Like, there's this thing that's going on with Yondu where where you know they're supposed to be in on it together, or he wants him to surrender it, and instead. Uh, Quill is going to this planet Xandar uh, to sell it to to this right. guy. Who so collects. it's a fairly simple a story. Quill is a uh, uh, you know he's he's a guy he's he's a thief or he's a he's a uh, like a Han Solo who who traffics in 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 uh, in contraband and he's trying to sell it. That's all. That's it. And then he's called upon to be more of a hero. As the right, he finds he finds out that he's got more than he bargained for, right? And right. and it's 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 this scene. It's it's this scene where he is kicked out of the uh, the broker's pawn shop. He is assaulted by Gamora. He is tried to be bagged by by uh, right. Rocket and, and Groot, Rocket. where he finds out that this is more than what he bargained for. Right. That that I so, think that's really the catalyst. So then, I mean, when does so so the the break in the two then is going to be. Uh, we're skipping the debate, but we're, we'll go back. The break in the two is when um, uh, Quill starts, uh, you know, once he has the orb, he goes and he tries to sell it, right? Uh, so, so, so to me, the catalyst is the acquisition of the orb. I guess. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't really see it that way. Uh, I, I guess that's one way to look at it, and this is one of the things I struggled with in writing this, I guess, or you know, writing the the, the beats down. Uh, you know, to me, th- like this is a long first act, 
Um, and, yeah. and, and I think the I think the break to two happens much later. I think because I think the debate part is really the question of whether these people can work together as a team, and that whole right. thing takes. There is to, the takes, whole there is the teaming up scenario. Right, and that whole thing takes place in this prison, right? Yeah. 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 Right, and so how do they get to the prison? They they get. Captured while this, as I said, where while the, what I think is the catalyst scene is going on, right? Well, they get they get arrested while while this melee is going on, and they're trying to, uh, you know, Gamora is trying to steal the orb, and and uh, Rocket's trying to nab uh, Quill, and and they're all, this. all trying to steal it from each other, right? Well, no, because Rocket doesn't care about the orb. He doesn't know what the orb is. He he just wants Quill, right? He's he wants about Quill. Him. Right, right, right. Okay, so, I mean, this is exactly, you know, in a romantic comedy where the two meet, you call that a meet-cute, right? This is like a meet-cute for our posse, right? Where right. they're all trying to get at each other. Um, one's trying to get the, uh, the stone. One's trying to get Quill. And one's trying to get, you know, Quill's trying to get out of there. They all end up in jail together. It's almost, uh, it's uh, un the usual suspects, right? Right. Yeah, they end up in jail together and then go on a mission together. So the break in the two, really, I think you're right, Chris, is once they decide to team up to break out of the prison, that, that's actually a much more active break in the two. Exactly, and that, that's the a decision. You know, the 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 hallmark for the break to two is always like a decision that is made. And if you think about, you know, the protagonist in this case as being the team, it's this team decision to yeah. do, move and break out. You know, and so our debate is this whole business of the different uh, of our of our heroes meeting up and kicking each other's asses, <coughs> dealing with the bad guys, um, uh, and the break into two is finally our team, but only for a limited time. Only limited only engagement. Limited engagement, right. Right, time. right, right. And, and also during this debate section, it's not only are they going to team up and break out, it's, you know, what are we going to do when we break up, team up and break out, right? Is It's, we're going to get the orb, and what are we going to do with the orb? And, and also, what are we going to do with Gamora? Because at this point in the story, we meet our fifth guardian, uh, Drax, who is just awesome. Yeah. Nothing Tell goes me why what you like about Drax. He's the most literal uh, <laughs> alien in the universe, right? Well, you know, let's talk about the comedy of this of this uh, of of this movie, man. This comedy <laughs> is hysterical. It is like, um, you know, it is a combination of like Army of Darkness sort of badass badassery and yeah. like this meta humor. That Quill is into this meta humor that's very modern, sort of yeah. stuff. Like, and I, I, yeah, and I, I love that. Like, Drax is more literal than a tree. Yeah, right? like, like Groot is not literal. He just says, "I am Groot," and it means something. Not literal at all. And here's Drax, who, who, like, you know, nothing goes over my head because my reflexes are too fast. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so you get um, Drax has a comedic. Moments. Quill, of course, throughout the whole thing is hilarious. Um, uh, what's your favorite line in the movie, Chris? <laughs> uh, what was that? They got my dick message. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. But, but like, there's this whole like fun and things and games thing, right? And like again, like the, the I'm I'm sorry, not fun and games, but the uh, like like you know there's, the, there's this stuff that goes on. You know that that are trailer moments, right? Like like yeah. you you've got That's John C. Riley, you know, processing them into the prison, and taking away uh, Quill's headphones and all the fun that comes out of that. And then you've got you know you've got even tension building there too in the midst of all this thing that's kind of fun. You know the introduce introduction of Rocket is fun because he's just weird. But like then you've also got this tension building because you, you introduce Drax and Drax wants to kill Gamora yeah. because, she, because she works for uh, because she works for Ronan and Ronan killed Drax's family and, and she, you know she has to now convince him that, that you know she's uh, you know betraying Ronan. Which by the way this is my one my single disappointment with this movie is that the reveal that she's betraying Ronan isn't earned, right? She just says they're in prison. Yeah. She says, "Oh, I was about to betray him, so it's okay." That, yeah, that it is, didn't seem like complaint. she was on his side at all. Anyway, they needed 
like an obligatory scene where Ronan like shows up like on a message and secretly telling her, so do you have, you know, are you doing everything according to plan? Or some obligatory screen where she's like making out with Ronan or something where you, you question her loyalty. We didn't have that. So yeah, Chris, they, they didn't earn that um, betrayal the, there. If, if, if that's I my mean, but, complaint but, about this movie, I mean, it's fine. Well, well, one second, Chris, though, right? Because that, that was like one of the problems for me in terms of um, sort of introducing that betrayal because it wasn't just Gamora. It was also Nebula, right? Um, and that was all done through just exposition. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to turn on, on Thanos, right? And like you said, it wasn't necessarily earned. You know, it, it was something that, I, for me, was like a failing in that they should have shown that. Don't tell us. Show basically, us how. Basically, Thanos is kind of a pussy in this movie. Everybody disobeys him. He's supposed to be this titan, and he can't right. keep anybody in line. <laughs> By the way, do we do I mean, we know? I mean, but to be fair, Thanos is in the other side of the universe, right? But he's right. supposed to be all powerful, and and everybody first chance they get are disobeying <laughs> him. Yeah, I mean, there's no is... consequences. But you know, it's yeah. it's almost a C story at this point. I mean, yeah. they're set they're setting up. But we did get more as far as Marvel uh, mythology goes. Didn't we get more Thanos than we've gotten any so far at all? The only other Thanos that we've gotten was the uh, was the button the at the end of the Avengers, right? Right, it was the Easter egg of Avengers, right? Right. right. So, do we know, by yeah. the way, it was I know that that Josh Brolin has been pegged to play Thanos. Was it hit? Was it Josh Brolin in this? Uh, uh, no, I, I'm not sure. I thought it was. Um, oh no, they had it's uh, the guy from the Blacklist. Wait, the, 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 the screenwriting list? The, uh, no, I'm sorry. The, the, the TV show. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like uh, Franklin Leonard, really? Um, I thought it was... Uh, yeah, right. I, I, think, I thought it was James Spader. Was it? I read that somewhere. Am I, huh. am I completely, am I completely uh, crazy here? I, I, I know uh, Josh Brolin is pegged to play him in whatever the future Well, I mean, I just is. checked the credits, and they have, and they do have list him, Josh Brolin, but he's uncredited. So. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Um, sorry, I was wrong. Okay. Uh, Spader is going to play Ultron. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah. God, okay. Sorry. So, um, so in the credits uh, for... So, Spader is going to be Ultron. Who I don't even know who the hell that is, guys. I'm not... I'm not uh, uh, a it's, it's a okay. Marvel guy. It's a robot, yeah. basically. Okay. Yeah, okay so that, that, but but that that's the antagonist. Let's in, not in get Manchester. ahead of ourselves. Right, um, right. You can wait. You can think of Ultron as like the ultimate Terminator. So, yeah. but, so but we got but, but we got Ultron who's like a Titan robot, and then we got Thanos who's like a <clears> Titan, <throat> like I there's way too many bad guys. That's something I wanted to talk about in this movie. There were so many antagonists. In Guardians of the Galaxy, okay, um, you know you've got you've got uh, Thanos. You've got uh, 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 at, the, at the beginning you've got um, you know Quill is being chased uh, by his stepfather dude. What's this guy's name? Uh, y y uh, Yondu. Yondu, right? Yondu, right? Right. right. Um, and right. then you you've got um, uh, you've got the guards of of. Uh, you got a, 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 a like um, uh, who's chasing Grax at the, Drax or at the beginning? You've got the guards in the, in the prison, right? Who are the pri who, who's who's running the prison? It doesn't matter. So, no, right? Nova. Uh, Nova. Nova. The, the guy. The, the guys. The Pandora. Right. But, yeah, but you've, got John, you've got Jaiman Hansu, who's playing Karath, like chasing Quill at the beginning, who shows up later, like one more time later. Um, you, but but he's just an agent. He's just an agent of, of Ronan, right? And Ronan, right. like Ro Ronan is Darth Vader, and, and, and Thanos is the Emperor, right? Like so. So there's okay, really just kind Korra of one. Is like a stormtrooper. All right, but but right. there was a lot of different bad guys in this, which is okay. I mean, I mean, I mean yeah. But, and during the debate, as we said, 
you know, all all of the heroes are antagonists to each other. They're all trying to get at each other. So, and we're also sorting out at this point. We're also sorting out who the bad guy is, right? Because Yondu is kind of a bad guy, and Ronan is a bad guy, and maybe Nova's a bad guy because they've imprisoned our heroes. And we're sorting that all out. But you know, so so I mean, I think most of these are just kind of obstacles, right? They're not they're not real antagonists. The only the the real antagonist is Ronan and his yeah. agents. But before we get away from the comedy, um, there there. The reason this film is an action comedy is they take every chance they can to crack a few jokes, okay, to, to write jokes into this script. Even in the serious action set pieces, they take moments to, 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 to write jokes in. And so this has, you know, the most comedy of any action uh, film I've seen, you know, since, like, The Expendables, you know, where they're just doing... One-liners throughout, in between action set pieces. So, to me, um, uh, that's where this this film succeeded. And you know, I gotta hand it to Chris Pratt. You know, he's got his comedy chops from Parks and Rec. You know, um, uh, he's he was not a star before this movie, but uh, I think he's definitely a star now. Yeah. No, I saw. I, I was watching a video today on YouTube, and somebody was saying, you know, like. Uh, <laughs> You know, he, he's kind of going to become America's sweetheart a little bit. You know, he, he's uh, because he's just a charismatic kind of funny dude, but but also he's showing his like his real acting chops, right? Because there's there's more to it than just cracking jokes. Right, and you guys, I mean, just this week you guys saw the YouTube of him uh, uh, going around the web uh, doing doing uh, doing Eminem. Eminem. Eminem, yeah, that yeah, was, yeah, that yeah was exactly. Great. And making fun of Orlando Bloom. He's one of these guys who he 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 has a comedic background. I wouldn't be surprised if he did improv comedy or whatever um, to end up on Parks and Rec. Yeah, you know, he's a com he's a comedic he's a comedic actor in the first place, like a Tom Hanks who uh, who right. always has really really good timing. Every every time you give him something funny to do, he can handle it. Even that dance scene in the third act. Dude, that's amazing. That that's, that's, a total, that's a total risk. Yeah, total risk. It could have been a horrible camping. train wreck. And oh yeah. He pays it off with I'm. It, he's like, what What are you doing? He's like I, it's, it's I'm distracting. distracting. <laughs> I'm distracting. <you. laughs> you think? Yeah. No, but you know, like yeah, he, I think he's one of these guys. Like he, you mentioned, Tom Hanks, right? Like you you ask anybody who's like under thirty. You know about Tom Hanks, and Tom Hanks has been a dramatic actor, right? Yeah, yeah. You, 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 ask, you ask guys like like us who've been around a little bit longer, and like my first memories of Tom Hanks are bosom buddies, right? Yeah, sure. And, and, and then like Joe yeah. versus the volcano, and, Saturday Night Live, Splash, yeah, right? Splash. Big, you yeah. know, and, and it just made the transition, and now you know he, he's pit. one of the the money pit. Yeah, exactly. The money pit. <laughs> 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 yeah, you guys should you should you Google search that moment from the Money Pit where <laughs> where the 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 bathtub falls through the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> Tom Hanks just starts laughing. He has this incredible <laughs> laugh, like unbelievable. And it's the, it's the same thing with Robin Williams, right? Like you think right. World According to Garp. It, you know, is is kind of a transition point for him because before then, it was like Mork from Mork, right? And, and and it was other stuff. And then he he plays you know Garp, which is like this comedic role. You know, I mean, like it's it's a funny movie. It's got some like really funny shit in it, but yeah. at the same time, it's a, an incredible dramatic role. Right, and then eventually he gets to uh, he gets to uh, Good Will Hunting and right Oscar Dead Poet and Society. Oh, it's and... uh, phenomenal, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Um, so okay, fun and games. Let's quickly some of your favorite set pieces from the fun and games. Guys. Wait, wait, before it gets fun and games, B story, oh, okay. B story. Oh, this is this sorry. is one I had a hard time pegging down, and I got my ideas about it, but I'm curious about what other people's ideas are. Now I had a hard time nailing down myself. Yeah, because the you know <laughs> there isn't really a love story between Gamora and uh, and uh, and and Star Lord. Like you kind of want one, but it's not really there in this movie. Right. My my idea is that. The uh, you know the, the B story at best. Yeah, at best, yeah. My yeah. idea about the B story is that it's it's a little thin. It's not like your love story, like the you know the way we think about a, a, a B story. You know, it's a B story in the sense of like a, a TV alternate story, which plays into the theme, right? Like, yeah. And and I think it's also the the B story plays into 
uh, a- into the larger Marvel universe as it's playing out in film, and it has to do, it has to do again. It has to do with family, but it has to do with Gamora and Nebula and Thanos and that whole family thing. Because in the end, it comes back, and, and there's a reflection of what's going on in terms of the whole family thing. There's a there's a because there's now a schism in that family at the end when you have Gamora versus Nebula. You get that whole fight going on, you know. Uh, you know, and, and you know, towards the climax when they're on the ship and heading down to Xandar. I, I yeah, think, you know, but again, it's kind of thin. I see what but you're saying that's more of a sea story, in my opinion, though. That that is a, a a a plot point that does play in later. To me, the strongest thing is what you, is it's actually close to what you said. It's the family itself. You know, it's these. You know, the romance, the bromance between all of these characters. They hate each other in the beginning, and then they. They, there are several moments, comedic yeah. moments, throughout um, uh, introduced right when they when they break into two and they become a team, where they're making fun of each other, where they're getting to know each other. Um, it's very much like a two-hander, like action comedy, like Lethal Weapon, where they're getting to know each other and yeah. um, the romance. You know, Lethal Weapon is yeah uh, because it's a real buddy on it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and and nowhere is this better um, displayed <coughs> as like you know towards the end, and we're getting ahead of our. I'm getting ahead of myself, but you know, like in the end, this is even reflected with Drax when he's talking about you know you know this tree man is my friend, and and this rodent is my friend, and Star Lord is my friend, and he even says, and this green whore. <laughs> Which, and, and then she stops him, and then like thirty yeah. seconds later, he blows away her sister for like she's like, you "Don't fuck with my friends," you know, and like that's that's beautiful, that's great writing, you know. Where did where did Gamora become a, a whore? By the way, I it's, be, he's just got this hang up that like because she's Thanos' daughter, and or or that she that she was a, a because she was an agent of Ronan and Ronan connected to Ronan. But but actually, that's kind of a little bit of a dialogue disappointment because he, because Drax is literal, right? Huh? Yes, and and so and so to me that that goes back to my uh, my Firefly called and once its concept back uh, theory because right right with Jane in, with Jane and Inara. Inara is a is her, is yeah, a literal like courtesan on Firefly. Right, and, and Mal always calls and, her a whore. Right, and right, and Jane's they're always giving her trouble, and Gamora actually is the female on the ship, and it's, you know, to me, I was like, oh, it's like maybe they had a subplot where Gamora, her name is Gamora, that's, you know, of Sodom and Gamora, right? Right, yeah. So maybe <laughs> I, she has a history yeah. of being, you know, yeah. more of a sexual being, I don't know if that's, Part of the mythology that they left out, and then the not joke sure. made it in. But um, by the way, know, speaking of not, Gamora, she's not sexualized in this story no. at all. No, and then and, 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 and you know credit for that, right? Like, because it's too easy at to all. do it. And, and, and I think mean, that was a purpose. It, yeah, and to give some credit, like let's let's talk for <laughs> just a second about uh, Zoe Saldana, mm-hmm. because like not only is she a solid actor, but like she is kind of like this this go to for these like awesome. Sci-fi chicks, right? Because yeah. you got you, you got her in Avatar, you've got her in Star Trek. Now you, now you've got her in Guardians, right? Yeah, like, you know she's, she's on. Doing she, it. She, she she said that she prefers doing these roles because in sci-fi the female roles actually get you know get get play. They get dialogue. They get page count as opposed to you know um, you know placeholder roles for female actresses in in your regular action movies, right? But nonetheless, this this movie does not pass the Bechdel test. Ah, uh, you'll be. Uh, I'll agree with you. <laughs> I'll agree with you there. If they if they added, well, she's just actually, another no, member. You, she's just another badass member of the team. Actually, you know what? Maybe maybe it does. Because because it does have her sister, and they do talk about something other than a man. They they don't talk about a man actually. Okay. So, so maybe it kind of does. Uh, they do. You're right. They talk about the betrayal of their father. So there is like a it. And there's more than one, and I, yeah. the fact that, that they do not fall prey, uh, it's not part of the Bechdel test, but, but the fact that they choose not to set up a Gamora, uh, Star-Lord uh, romance is right. credit. Is credit um, yeah. Like, Star-Lord tries, that's just part of him, right? Like, he's a rogue. He, he's, he's a player. He's going to try, he, but it just doesn't he, work out. 
he he he's the slut, right? He's he Quill Quill right. is the whore, right? Jackson Pollock. <laughs> <laughs> that was so funny to me because when I was thinking about Firefly versus uh, versus uh, um, uh, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, like you know, uh, uh, Mal Nathan Fillion has has like. Total respect for Serenity, whereas you know Tyler does has no respect for his ship. Right, he's like he's like having sex all over it, or, like, or spanking it all over the ship. So it's a bit of a it's a different character there, but um, <coughs> not caring. All right, so now uh, quickly because uh, you guys were going too long already. Fun and games, favorite set pieces. You know, I think I think actually my favorite set pieces happen in in, in the first act. My, my favorite set pieces hap, happen during the debate and early on when these guys are just coming together. But there's a lot of stuff that happens in you know in Act Two. Uh, you know, the meeting of the collector, right? Like there's this big action set piece where where a drunken Drax like just phones Ronan and says, you know, come at me, bro. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You know, like that's that's amazing to me. That that was a lot of fun. You know? <laughs> Keith, do you have any some fun and games for us? I mean, it's you know battling, you know, flying all over the, you know. Uh, I mean, I'd have to say, um, sort of, it was like right around the the the, the prison sequence, right? But the the fact that um, in 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 Rocket's plan, he's like, and that guy, I need that leg. <laughs> yes. In terms of, um, I need that leg. Right, right. Remember? Oh, yeah. that's brilliant. And, and he goes to such lengths, lengths to get the leg. And Rocky's just like, dude, I was just fucking. And they, just, they have a great the leg. Cutaway. They have a great cutaway then, in where the guy is like, "You need my leg." <laughs> and then I love later on when right? they pay it when they pay it off and they and bring then, it and back then, and like, like, his arm. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, um, you know, <clears throat> Chris mentioned the. I mean, can we talk about the collector, Benicio okay. del Toro? Yeah. Like, how interesting was he? You know, yeah, because, how interesting because, was that character? It was because, a short. It was a short piece. It was. I thought he was gonna have a bigger role in this, right? Because yeah. they 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 had him. What well, it was it? Was it was Thor: Dark World, right? Where they had uh, where where they had the after credit sequence with him. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Tell me more. I'm 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 lost. I that did not register with me. It, it was just the collector. The collector. He's got all these things. Um, all these Easter eggs. Uh, in his in his uh store, right? He's like, right. He, He's got a ton of stuff from the Marvel Universe. Menagerie. He collects different species, and yeah, he's got a menagerie going, right? Yeah. Yeah, and then he he collects other things too. I don't think he just collects like, like living things because you know at the end of at the at the after credit sequence of of Thor Dark World, you've got I can't remember who it is. It's uh, it's two two of the characters. They bring uh they bring something to him to to hold on to right. Like so, I think there's so, there's something more, and he probably has a bigger role to play. And I, it wouldn't just just given the way things are going, it wouldn't surprise but me. As far as the mythology is concerned, you know, he's kind of like in in uh, James Bond. He's like Q, like the quartermaster, who's always got the MacGuffin you need. He's always yeah. got the item you need at the beginning of your adventure, and the, you hand him something at the end of the adventure. You know, so he's like uh, uh, he serves this uh, this uh, quartermaster sort of function. Yeah. Um, can we can, up there. can we talk about the midpoint? What is the midpoint of the movie here? So uh, so my take on the midpoint is is, is that it's essentially. Um, you know, Keith. Keith, you have a midpoint. Oh no! I was thinking that uh, Ronan Ronan grabs. Yeah, no, yeah. For me, the midpoint was Ronan has the Infinity Stone. Um, yeah. He betrays Thanos and he heads over to Xander. Right. Well, once. He, uh, yeah, it's when Ronan gets the Infinity Stone. That was the. Uh... Does that make sense, uh, Chris? 
Yeah, and, and there's a lot of things going on right here, right? Like Ronan has the Infinity Stone, uh, and at the same time, there, there's this break point with Quill where he finally does something noble, right? And, you know, he's going to get captured by, by Yondu, right? Because he he goes to save Gamora, right? And that, 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 that signals bad guys closing in at the same time, right? Because he actually even calls a quote-unquote bad guy, right? Like Yandu to come get him, right? Like so, so all this thing happens at once, right? Like Drax dies, kinda um, until that was Gr a total. By the way, that was a total like uh, Chronicles of Riddick moment where he like calls up the uh, bounty hunters to come save him, and then they they save him from the bigger bad guys. Yep. There was another. Yeah. There's another Chronicles of Riddick. Uh, uh, yeah, th thing in here, uh, uh, reference in here, because Ronan looks a ton like the Necromongers from Chronicles of Riddick, right? Yeah, there's a little bit of that. Yeah, his ship even has this like slatted design. A lot like. Uh, the, by the, the way, I loved his ship. I loved yeah, his ship. The ship it was like this great. twisted looking bird kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it had some of the uh, architectural similarities to the Necromonger ships, and uh, and even even the way uh, he puts the Infinity Stone. Um, uh, in into his hammer is a lot like the uh, Grand Marshal in in Chronicles, but I won't belabor that point. So, um, so yeah, I, th I think I think you're right. I, th I think because because that's you know again midpoint is always when the story changes, right? Yeah. And and the dynamic changes once uh, Ronan has the stone, right? Like that's just right. So a story was let's sell the stone. Midpoint story escalates. We've lost the stone, and now the worst guy in the universe who could have it. We didn't know it was just stone. A, a story was let's sell the orb. Uh, midpoint is now the bad dude has stolen the orb, and it turns out to be one of the most powerful things in the freaking galaxy. Right. Uh, so now, now we got to get it back. We got to get it back. Okay. And um, that's when, as you said, the B story crosses again, right? The B story crosses at the midpoint. The B story is when, if, if the B story is truly the family, right? This, this surrogate family coming together and, 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 uh, and Star-Lord decides to actually risk himself for right. Gamora. Now the family is starting to come together. It's, it's, it's coming together, but it's also physically split. Right, yes. because because Did because Rod, Rod yeah. and Drax are. I think we've lost David. Or I'm sorry. I think we've lost Keith. By the way. Yeah, let's not, see if we can get him back. Yeah. I'll work on that. So so um, keep going. You have on your theory. So so yeah. So like the, the again, the, this is where uh, that B story, that family story, crosses right because um, because you know not only has is Quill made a transformation and accepted, you know that that. You know he's willing to make a sacrifice or take a deep chance, uh, saving Gamora. At the same time, you know they're separated from from Rocket, from uh, Groot, and from Drax, who now have to make a decision that they're going to try to rescue these guys and keep the family together, right? So, so there, there's definitely a lot going on there, and there, there there's a hit there um, with with the family. So yeah, that's that's another mark of the midpoint is that the team gets separated, right? Yeah. You know, Obi-Wan separates from, from Luke at the midpoint in Star Wars. <laughs> like, you, you, uh, you want to... You that, that, that helps create more escalating antagonism in the second half of the second act when bad guys close in. Yep, and an, impor an important note here, and you know, we're, because I, I like to try to point this stuff out, because we're not, we're, you know, we're not doing this just to, to analyze the movie. We're doing this, you know, as a screenwriting exercise too. That's right. And an important note here is that chronologically, this happens about two thirds of the way through the movie, right? So the midpoint is really about two thirds of the way through the movie, because it's it's really is a midpoint. Right? Because yeah, is that because we have a long first act and a long debate? It's because we have a long first act, but but it, it it's also because like there's more time taken with the things that happen earlier in the script. So in terms of time, it happens longer longer through the movie, but in terms of stuff that happens, in terms of events, it's probably just about right. You know what I mean? Because yeah. after this, things start to happen, like dominoes start happens, falling a lot like faster. Quicker. The, 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 the third act is really tight, actually. Um, you're, well, not, yeah. you're not getting a Man of Steel third act that goes on forever. Which, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, like, just let me say, like, in terms of comparing this to Man of Steel, like, one of the most pleasant things, or, like, gratifying things to me about this was that 
they destroyed a city without turning it into destruction porn, right? Right, like, like right, Man, right. Man of Steel destroyed a city, and they took like 40 minutes doing it. Like here, it's like 30 seconds of screen time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, let's get there. Let's just get to the third act. Um, so yep. bad guys close in. Have you got anything? Yeah, I mean, th this is, uh, you know, uh, like Rock and Groot trying to save uh, Quill and Gamora. Uh, you've got Ronan deciding that he's, you know, going after Novacore. Right, right. Like he, he's heading to Xandar. Like all this bad stuff is happening. Uh, right, Yandu... so Xandar. Now we're now we're getting to a, a bigger plot, right? Because Ronan now he's trying to take over this planet. Right, right. and 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 he's and, and he he's wants to gone against the planet. Thanos. He wants to he wants to go the full Alderaan on the planet. Right, and he, he's also you know he's gone against Thanos, right? So now he he's gone. He's a rogue that's gone rogue, you know, and. Like things are getting worse. Yandu has Quill and Gamora, and and now Quill has to convince him that you know that they can still work together, and he doesn't need to just be killed, right? Like the obstacles are harder now. You know, it's not, and it's not just physical obstacles, right? Like because early on it was, you know, it was how do we get the orb out of this prison, and how do we get it to where we can sell it or or, or do whatever. And, and and now it's, you know, how do we survive, and how do we rescue our friends, and, and how do we defeat Ronan, and how do we beat him to Zan, uh, Xandar, right? Like, it's the, the stakes are higher, I guess is the best way of putting that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, much higher stakes. It's not just we're trying to uh, 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 deliver a... a Piece of contraband, get paid for it. Now we're saving a planet. Yep. Now, <laughs> the planet. What is it called? Xandar. Xandar. It's pretty. It's pretty fucking silly. It's right. Like sure. The Glenn Close and and the John C. Riley characters representing this planet. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, these are you know like in the, always one of the things that and one of the reasons I probably never read Gar Guardians of the Galaxy is probably. One of the reasons I never read much of Silver Surfer or anything like that is like what like I love superheroes, but once you got out into space, it just kind of bored me. And I know that like these Nova Corps guys, you know, with their helmets and their three little dots on the chest and whatever that like that's part of that whole like Marvel galaxy type universe. But like that that never really appealed to me much. And, and is the Nova Corps a big deal in the? Like like I said, I never really read it all that deep. Uh, I, okay. But I, I I know them from around. Like I know I've seen them in you know in comics and you know stuff like that for for years. So so I mean I know they've been a presence and 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 you know they're something that's been there forever. And so they put them in this and you know it, it's kind of cool that they did it. And it didn't bother me how they they did it. And part of it was that like action comedy thing that they got going. And yeah. and to reinforce that, you got freaking John C. Riley, right? Like like. <laughs> You know, like uh, he's he now he has both dramatic and comedic shops, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and then you got Glenn Close, right? Like, I mean, that that that's solid. And yeah, the world was a little bit silly, but it was you know, it it just set up this. And it, again, it's comic book. It's it's it's. You know, like, uh, it created some big stakes because really, right. I, I don't know why. I, I really don't know why um, Quill would want to save this planet. Do we know? I mean, what what does he care about it? Is his, I thought his uh his stepfather is um, you know like one of the the enemies of this planet, right? He's the queen. yeah, but there, yeah, but there's a truce. But like you know the thing the thing about you know Quill is like in the end he's a hero, right? Like and a hero doesn't let billions of people die, right? Like even though he's a like at the end Han Solo didn't let people die, right? Han Solo came back and saved the galaxy even though he his last name is Solo, right? Like you know I know and that's his arc. I get it. Um, yeah. So all right, so Bad Guys Close In is filled with what? Keith, you back? Uh can you hear me? Yeah man, you're good. good. Um, what what do you have for Bad Guys Close In? Um <clears throat> all right, so I think for me because that <clears throat> actually, Chris and I spoke a little bit earlier um, before the podcast. It seems like all of it kind of is like in intermingled, you know. Um, but back, uh, all is lost, Dark Knight of the Soul, and then Breaking in Three. Um, to me, it seems. Uh, I mean, I think that you know that 
Chris, the, the the low point is pretty well understood, right? Right. I mean, you know, and if you go back to like, you know, uh, it, the, the 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 touch of death, right, or the the scent of death, right? Like Groot right. dies death. or kind of dies, right? Like the you know the, the 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 low point is definitely the loss of Groot, and you know, like, and also like they they have kind of succeeded, but also kind of failed because they infiltrated. Ronan's ship, but Ronan made it to Xandar, right? And and you know they all made it alive except for Groot because of Groot's sacrifice. And yeah, that, I mean that that's a pretty solid low point. The third act, the third act for me is just this, you know, full on Star Wars uh, like <coughs> like dogfight scenario, right? Yeah, and and so like and this is where it gets muddy, right? Because once you come out of the like. The the bad guys closing in like this whole all is lost like like in the end of the third act like it, it's just like the 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 end of the second act and the beginning of the third act all kind of bleed together and you got things like it, I think it's structurally sound which is you, fine yeah it's just it's just na it's naturally flowing yeah 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 it's it's great and like you got this thing like Keith was just saying you know we before we were chatting before the podcast and like I feel like the you know what you would consider the Dark Knight of the Soul break into three and the finale all kind of happen in the same scene, right? Like, which is this scene, like that you were talking about earlier with the dancing and the in the you know the 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 hands joining to hold the Infinity Stone and like this all happens in one kind of long scene that, that that's really cool, but you know it's not really separate. The, um, the <coughs> sort of the Nova ship nets by Ronan, yeah. like yeah, that's a great set piece. Remind, remind the the Nova net. Yeah. Um, that 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 uh, reminded me of the last Starfighter, the Frontier, and the last Starfighter. Oh man, ah, I love the last Starfighter. Yeah. Yes, totally. Yeah. Oh my god. Good call. Wow. No, no, I can't believe I didn't think of that. I love that movie, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think everybody does. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we need to go back a little further to get to the low point, then, because Groot's death is kind of a third act thing. I don't know that that's a low point. I think. Um, maybe it's, uh, there's an earlier whiff of death. Um, well, there's, like, Drax gets killed by Ronan, or kind of killed, but then Groot brings him back, right? Like, so that's, that, like, that doesn't even count. Like, he gets defeated, but then, like, Groot brings him back, like, 30 seconds later. Right. right. A, low, a low point for me, and now, mind you, <coughs> the way my memory is a little wonky, is the, <coughs> the part in the film where, sort of, like, the question of, are these all, it's this group of misfits, it's this group of anti-heroes, folks who are not used to fitting in anywhere. Like, are they going to fit in with each other? And there's that moment where they decided, we can't work together. There you go. That's a right? good point. What, what, what causes well, the... But, but where does that happen? That's what, I mean, that's the thing. Like, I, I remember it happening, but my, is it right around the time that Drax is like, I'm out? He goes off to the bar. Yeah, but that's, um, like, that's halfway through the movie. But like, that's like, er, that's you know, that's earlier before like they that, are. That's yeah. that's midpoint stuff. You know, and th this is you know again, this is where like this this all gets muddy. And like the thing is, you know, and again, you screenwriters out there, take note. You know, yeah, like, it's starting. This is not be all end all, right? Like this is muddy in terms of what but, you think of it. The second the second half of the second act has. More antagonism, but the character stuff starts to drop a little bit, right? And this right. is the hardest part of screenwriting: is the second half of the second act. But right? but it's but it's all sound, right? Like it's all structurally sound. Like it all fits together. It it comes in a logical order, and it all pays off. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm I mean I'm fine I'm fine I'm fine with you know, I was okay with it because you know, I'm entertained by the comedy. Like there's so much comedy keeping me going. Um, it uh, so uh, oh oh you get you get um, so in the third act you get like the multiple storming the castle thing right where you get um, uh, you get the arrow set piece right uh, finally yeah. the, you get the arrow oh yeah that was great. how the arrow works right. After he's been threatening, uh, because he's been menacing <laughs> people with it the whole time, and then you see how deadly it is. Right. Yeah, I I read online that his character, um, in the comic book is really just an archer who's like a badass like with a bow, and he's like younger, and they and he has like a magic arrow that can hit more than one thing. But they turn this into some weird like, 
you know, like because uh, well, we've already got a super bad archer in the uh, in the Marvel universe on, yeah. on film, right? Yeah. I know, I know. Um, so then we I, we also had uh, what I felt like we had like the Star Wars dogfight set piece in the third act, and we had like this Pearl Harbor sort of set piece where they just start bombing the planet, and everybody's running around. Yeah. So Pearl Harbor Independence Day. Kind of. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Right, Independence Day, right, same kind of a multi third act. You know, in an action, this, yeah, the third act for this is not, uh, isn't all comedy. It's more action, right? It, that's where the action comedy reverts back to the action side. It's in the third well, there's, act. There's still plenty of comedy in heart in it. I mean, like like we said before, man, that dance scene. Right. Like, him, him just, like that's like. Uh, like that's so ballsy to put in there because like it, it so could have been bad, but it paid off so well. Right, but you got the dance scene in because you know you you had so much tension sort of building up to that scene, and you know you <coughs> so the ship is down, Ronan is there, he's got the staff, he's got the Infinity Stone, it's over its curtains, it's wrapped all its tension, and you got to figure out some way to break it, right? Yep. Because it is that, you know, sort of varying off in that action um, comedy realm. And then you've got Rocket in the background, sort of, you don't know what he's, you don't know exactly what he's building, but you know he's building something, and you know it's going to be yeah. deadly, and you know that, like, you know, Star-Lord le- needs to, to buy him some time. And, so, and you've, yep. and yeah, you've no. earned it, right? Like, you, you've, you've earned the whole thing, because you've seen Rocket building stuff on the fly, and that works. And and you, you've you earned, like, through through hearing having him listening to music and being just kind of a, you know, like, just a wacko, you know, like, you... you you buy that uh, that Star Lord is doing this dance. You're like, it's not coming out. It's not entirely out of left field, you know. Yeah. What was the moment where where Rocket starts to get down on himself, where he's like, I don't know, I'm not even like a raccoon. I was just like. Yeah, that's all know. part of the bad guys, I think. Now, to like, me, yeah. that's a, I think that's what that's a, a low point area. Um, it's a little bit. It is kind of what Keith was talking about earlier, where they start to doubt themselves and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so Rocket's got the weapon, and Star Lord's got the dance. Um, Gamora has the final fight um, against Nebula, right? Right. Who um, cuts off her own hand? Who's like yeah. kind of like a bitchy eye robot, you know? Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, but she turns out to be pretty badass, um, and. Um, you know, that's your third act. The, the the moment with Groot saving them, that's third act. That's not necessarily low point. I think it, the low point must happen earlier. But that was, to me, you know, emotionally, like the best moment of the film where he says, we are Groot, yeah. you know? <laughs> yes, his only other line. Yeah. This was, yeah. This, this was a stretch for Vin Diesel. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> man. Vin Diesel got paid for this, man. He... It's, he he said, like, we, uh, yeah, I am Groot in, like, 60 languages, and then he went on the press junket. Yeah. Unbelievable. And they get to put his name on the movie, but um, I don't know. So that's that's it for the beats. Guys, let's let's wrap up, like, final thoughts, things you... Uh, Chris, yeah. what did you... Uh, what were your final thoughts on Guardians? Man, I, I, just, I, dude, I just love this flick. I want to see it again. It's just, it, it, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's one of my... My top superhero, well, not superhero, but t- top comic book movies, okay. you know, like. And as a script. Solid, man, and it, you know, it, 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 it fits the mold and it breaks the mold. It's, it's structurally sound. The character development is awesome. You love, you end up loving all of these characters, you know, and and, and you know, like I, ha- again, I, I've seen like I, I could complain about two pretty minor things in this whole script. Um, None of which broke my enjoyment of it at all. It, yeah, it's a lot... it just keeps moving you forward anyway, you know. Yeah, no, it's 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 rock solid. You don't get left in the dust. Everything pays off. I uh, felt that like... way a lot about uh, Thor: Dark World, where there yeah. was definitely some plot problems, but it kept moving forward so fast, and there was enough character development between Loki and Thor that I was fine with it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, no, and it, it compare I think it compares favorably to to Avengers, right? Like Avengers had had a different thing going, but as far as like this team building thing that just kept moving forward, it was great. This yeah. was a lot less like the plot I think was a lot less complicated. You didn't get bogged down in a bunch of crap. 
uh, you know, they, they, they're still fun, but, like, this is just really, really, you know, like, it, it's just solid storytelling. Awesome. Keith, as a script, uh, what was your, your final take on Guardians? Okay, I mean, you know, I'm going <coughs> to, excuse me, I'm going to echo Chris. I thought it was, um, you know, very well structured. What they were doing, what James Gunn <coughs> was doing was you're expanding and building on this world, right? Because, you know, thus far, the Marvel Universe has been either Earth, Midgard, or, like, yeah, that's it. We haven't had, we've had um, allusions to Thanos and outer space. Here, this, this script, this movie brought it out. It brought it out to the universe. Right? Mar the Marvel Galaxy, like... Right, right, right. The right, template right, right. for what we're going to get used to for the next 10, 15 years. And it did it in a way that, um, you know, like we, we mentioned, you have, like, these disparate characters. They're all rebels. They all have sort of, like, their assignments, things in which they need to accomplish during this film. And... Well, what you know, are, they, they, are there other are there other properties in the in the in the Marvel universe that take place in the Marvel galaxy that are not uh, superheroes on Earth? Yeah, Silver Surfer. Silver, Silver Surfer, Surfer, but we don't um, right. We don't know what they're going to do with the Fantastic Four, right? Because that right. was their opportunity to be galactic, but they chose not to, right? They just kind of kept it. They kept it on Earth, right? Right. Right. Yeah. So I mean, with get with um, Guardians of the Galaxy, it it opens up. You know, <clears throat> I'll take a, a step back and I'll go back, uh, continue on like how I feel about this, right? Um, in uh, 2008, right, the I guess preparing us for the movie, they reissued Guardians of the Galaxy, right? And um, the the way the book was pretty <clears throat> pretty much the graphic novel pretty much um, gives us what we have now in terms of the movie itself, what it was, what it would actually end up being. And, you know, the comic integrates by, like, the second graphic novel, Iron Man, and starts to integrate, you know, more of sort of, like, the Terran influence. You get a little bit more um, information regarding <coughs> Star-Lord, which was, which we didn't even talk about, right? Which is that the fact that, you know, he was actually abducted and he was meant to go to his father. No, no spoilers. No spoilers. We we don't. No we, spoilers. We, 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 no, they right. they okay, into it. Go. I don't want to know where that. Keith. I don't know when. I don't want to know about Star Lord's father. I know there's a whole thing there. I started reading something on the internet. Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I wasn't even going to go into that, but I'm saying they set that up for us, though. Okay. Right? Yeah, they allude to it. Yeah, for, for right? sure. You, you know, you know, like I mean, I don't even know. So <laughs> to be fair, I can't even give give out um, spoilers. But I would say that you know we mentioned. During the conversation, you know, of course we talk Whedon, right? And then we mentioned a couple of films, um, <clears throat> Alien Resurrection and The Last Starfighter. It had a really good feel to it, sort of like the classic 80s science fiction movie. It wasn't hard science fiction. It was, you know, sort of like pleasant science fiction, if that even exists. I don't know. I'm the space talking. opera. Yeah, yeah, space yeah. opera, right? Yeah. Um, it was... It, you know, for everything that it had going on, the movie it, it had heart, right? And you only get that heart because you realize the characters, you know, had this arc where they realize that, you know what, we needed, to, you know, these they, <clears throat> they realize together and separately that, you know what, sometimes you got to reach out. And I'm, you know, I just want to, and let me close on that moment. Like, that is, again, is... You know, uh, credit to James Gunn, <laughs> but it, it it is out of the Joss Whedon playbook. You know, he's he's got a famous quote that says, you know, uh, they ask him how you know he gets his fans to be so uh, dedicated to to Joss's stories, and he says, I don't write characters that you like. I write characters that you love, and this movie is a is 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 right out of the Joss Whedon playbook. The same way Avengers was. You get to love all these characters. You, you, they all have a, a, a solid role. They're not just sitting there, um, you know. Uh, yeah, even Hawk, <laughs> even Hawkeye had a freaking story in Avengers, right? So, like everybody gets their turn to play. It's like Little League, and you get to love everybody. And especially, it's especially important when you're doing the surrogate family. 
uh, uh, scenario, the surrogate family theme, so that we that everybody has a place. Um, the for me, this uh, this film, this the script, the story here was very solid. Again, structurally fine. It's a tentpole movie, but it does to me seem more more like an action comedy, like Zombieland or uh, like um, uh, Pineapple Express, where uh, we've, we've, we've hit this genre bend of action-adventure and full-on, you know, PG-13 to R-rated comedy, um, where you are back and forth between action set-piece and comedy set-piece. And this takes, you know, muscle, you know, the best writing muscles from both sides of, of the screenwriting world, from comedy and from drama. And uh, this, uh, this movie exceeds Avengers in its comedy moments, right? Sure. It exceeds Avengers. Avengers had some great comedy moments with, uh, with, uh, um, uh, with Iron Man and with, with the Hulk and versus Loki and, and uh, you know... Puny God and such, you know. But yeah. like, uh, you know, you we have an army. We have a Hulk. Like, there there was great comedy in Avengers, but there was not the level of comedy that um, Guardians of the Galaxy brought. Um, and so that's where I think it has uh, really, from a writing perspective, um, staked out new territory. Um, and uh, you know. It, it, and and I can't, we can't underestimate uh, what you guys said earlier about um, how it successfully introduced a new set of characters, a new universe, a totally new mythology to a broad audience successfully um, through great writing, through caring about the characters, through an interesting uh, mythology, um, a deep mythology. Very little of the existing Marvel mythology was used. You know, very yeah. little. You know, very very little. You know, it stood on its own. So, um, a real success. Um, so, uh, I, thank you guys for. Uh, hey, real yeah. quick, b before we sign off, one 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 quick uh, thing I wanted to note. Just credit where it's due. We yeah. keep talking about James Gunn, but the screenwriting credit here is actually James Gunn and Nicole Perlman. Excuse so it was me, another yeah, writer. Should have done that at the top of the show. Yeah. Yep. And at the top of the show. Yeah, and and I checked her out. She doesn't have any real. She doesn't have many writing credits, but she is apparently she's done a treatment for the Black Widow movie. So uh, okay. So you know, I mean, if if uh, if she keeps up the work like this, and and you know, and actually writes that thing, I'll I'll be looking forward to it. That's absolutely. Great. I mean, I'll I'll be right there in the theater with you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, well, so about five thousand miles apart. So, uh, let me. Post <laughs> West Side. Oh, this is a uh, this is a this is a national podcast. And uh, uh, just real quick too, the button at the end. I mean, we spoiled this whole thing, so why not? Yeah. Howard the Duck. What the hell? Yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Right? Yeah. Yes. The only the 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 only. Uh, I mean. A lot of people look at Howard the Duck as uh, a, that was a Steven Spielberg movie, by the way. Right. Okay. Well, he and produced then, it. He did the right. He produced it. Okay. Okay. He was he was involved with it, right? But then there was a Marvel comic series. In the 80s. <coughs> well, yeah. he came out of the comics, so that is right. one of the only other comics that had a real comedic feel to it. Right. You know, this light, campy comedy. That so I think maybe that was the connection. Do you have any idea where the Howard the Duck connection came from, guys? No, I, but I mean, I'll say this much though, right? I saw it and they're like, Howard the Duck, what? Like before you're like, awesome. It's like, wait a minute, that makes sense. The tone of the movie itself, right? The tone of what we got from, you know, <coughs> Gun and Perlman script, you know, Gun's film. So yeah. the tongue, tongue in cheek, not really taking ourselves seriously. You get that and, you, and this is like what you can expect, you know, for like the future installations of Guardians. It's, yeah. it's 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 almost in this in this action comedy genre that they're trying to 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 innovate in, you know, pull, pulling Howard the Duck in is like street cred, man. It's like yeah. saying, "Yes. Yes, that's where we're going to go." Yeah. Okay? Definitely.
So, I mean, oh. all right. I loved right. it. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah. All right, guys. So this is uh, thanks, Chris Durham, Keith Miller. I'm David Degren. Uh, this is the script, a beat sheet edition podcast of the uh, NYC Screenwriters Collective. Find us at uh, screenwriterscollective.org or on Twitter, at ScriptFeed, or on Facebook as well. Um, thanks very much, guys.